So how's everybody doing? Mostly feeling okay? Not mauled by bears. It's good. All right. Um, so we're finally through that big chapter, whatever that was. Six? Six, yeah. Um, so we should do a quiz on that stuff. Maybe Wednesday before lab? Is that good? Okay. So we'll do that Wednesday um, right at the beginning of class before we start lab this week. Today we're going to talk about the next chapter, which is talking about chemical reactions and quantities and things like that. So um, I have candy. It's almost all in there. I like candy. Um, but actually, the candy is for learning, so I'm sorry. Um, but we'll also get to eat it. But I think that'll help us understand this. We'll see. I haven't done this before. Everything's better with, with candy, so that's what's really important. Um, all right. So before we do that, we have to do this. Um, let's talk about chemical equations. So you might have you might have seen these kinds of things before. You might not. Um, so we're going to talk about them. Something looks like this. Have you seen something like that before? We've seen some of these things in lab a little bit. We haven't really talked about what it means or how we write them or what they're for. So um, what does that tell you? Which is also called water. water. Yeah, right. So hydrogen gas and oxygen gas do something together, and the result is water. How did you know that hydrogen and oxygen gas are what you start with? It's because it has the, it's on the left side of the equation. It's on the left side of the equation. That's kind of, I mean, it seems obvious to us, but because we read from left to right. Uh, but in a chemical equation, we have to be a little bit more careful than that. We have to look at the direction of the arrow. Because sometimes this will be written the same basic way, but the arrow will be turned the other way. And we'll be talking about it going the other way instead. Sure. Well, water can exist in any of the three states, right? Because it could be a solid, which is ice. It could be a liquid, which is water. It could be um, a gas, which is water vapor. In this particular reaction, what's formed is the gas. That's right. The reactants. So let's start labeling stuff, I guess. The arrow tells us which direction we're going, like where we're starting and where we're ending. So in this reaction, and in most that we write, with some exceptions, we're going to start on the left and end on the right. So that means the stuff on the left is called the reactants, or sometimes the reagents, or the starting materials, or something like that. Um, and the stuff on the right in this reaction, or on the other side of the arrow, is referred to as the products. Now, this reaction only has one product, but a reaction could easily have two or more on either side. So it doesn't just have to be two on one side and one on the other. It could be three or four on one side, three or four on the other. It just depends on what's going on in that particular reaction. So uh, we look for that arrow, and we decide whether the reagents are what the products are. So you also pointed out the little G in parentheses. That tells us the state of the various things. So in this particular reaction, we have all gaseous reagents, or all gaseous um, reactants and products. So gas gets a G in parentheses, probably guess these. Liquid gets an L. Solid gets an S. And then there's one more we call aqueous. And that gets an AQ, 
And that means dissolved in water. So a lot of times when we're reacting things or doing reactions, we're doing them in solution. And the reason for that is gases can be, gases can react okay, but you gotta mix them in some kind of a vessel that can hold the gases. Liquids can mix okay, but there aren't that many things that exist in a liquid phase that isn't at really high temperature. Solids tend not to react really well together, with some notable exceptions, but because the molecules can't come in close that close of a contact with solids, because even if it looks like a really fine powder. If you really zoomed in on it, it would still be some chunks. So the chunks can only hit each other at certain spots. So solids don't usually react really well um, with each other. So we often dissolve things in water first and then allow them to react because when the molecules are in water, they're moving all around and they can orient themselves to react with other stuff however they want. So we'll see that a lot, uh, these aqueous types of reactions. All right, um, so that's our chemical equation. Anybody see anything wrong with this chemical equation? There's something wrong here. Yeah, we lost an oxygen. Does everybody see that? If we add up the total numbers of hydrogen and oxygen on the left and on the right, we see there's two hydrogen and two oxygen on the left, and two hydrogen and one oxygen on the, on the right. Why is that not good? Why is that a problem? It is. Why is that a problem? What does that mean physically? Yeah, it's not. Why isn't it possible? Because there aren't enough re uh, reactants to form the product. Right. Well, yeah. What we could say is the way that we've written it right here is as though one oxygen atom is simply vanishing, disappearing, ceasing to exist, and that can't happen because something called the law of conservation of mass or conservation of matter. You can't do a chemical reaction and have stuff just disappear. Can't have it appear either. All the matter has got to stay on Earth, basically, or you know, around. It's got to still exist. Um, so that doesn't work. So what do we do? Should we have written plus O on this side? Does that work? What's wrong with that? Everybody's shaking heads here. Why doesn't that work? Right, it kind of, that makes it, that, that changes the reaction, right? I mean, we could do this reaction, we can measure the products, and there is no oxygen in the products. There's no free oxygen atoms in the products. We know from our work last week that there aren't even such things as free oxygen atoms, really. Oxygen binds together to make O2. So that doesn't even really exist. And it's not part of this reaction. So we can't just add stuff into the reaction that isn't there in the first place. So that doesn't work. What if we put a two, whoops, down here. That's balanced, right? I mean, it's balanced, right? Yeah. yeah. So is it good? Are we good? Do we fix the problem? What's wrong now? What? It's a different thing, right? We changed, anybody know what that is? Hydrogen peroxide, yeah, is that the same as water? No. No. Please don't think that hydrogen peroxide is the same as water. It won't taste delicious and make you less thirsty. It will foam up and like, yeah. Um, so not water. Anybody ever give a bunch of hydrogen peroxide to a dog to make them throw up when they eat something they're not supposed to? No. Um, well, yeah, but you throw it up. Yeah, what? Yeah, but like it also produces, it fizzes, it produces hydrogen gas or oxygen gas. Um, and so when the dog throws up, it's like a giant like tube of foam just like everywhere. It's really gross. It's worse. Yeah. Um, so anyway, what? Yes. <laughs> Yeah, I don't remember if this was, I don't think it was our dog. It was, I think it was my in-law's dog ate a bag of chocolate. That's what I was thinking. My yeah. dog recently ate chocolate coins. <laughs> and we pulled it back and I was like, um, you have a new feed. How much did she eat? 
as much. Um, can, yeah, it depends how much they have and how and like if it's dark chocolate or milk chocolate, the the chemicals that give them trouble. Anyway, we're a little off track, but that's okay. So if you have that problem, you may see a giant foam snake shooting out of your dog's mouth <laughs> and, and have a fun evening cleaning the carpet. Uh, yeah, so anyway, all right, so we can't do that. So don't balance things by changing the little numbers at the bottom because then you're changing what the compound is and that's not gonna work. All right, so what do we do instead? We got a problem here, right? It's not, it's not right, it looks like something's disappearing. So. How do we make it so things aren't disappearing? Yeah, so what we're really saying here is that, so like, yeah, we'll talk about how to actually do it, but what we're really saying is that the ratio is wrong. All right, in other words, let's draw these um, things out so you can see. So here's what a hydrogen molecule looks like, here's what an oxygen molecule looks like. And here's what a water molecule looks like. Okay. And then you can see that, that oxygen atom disappearing. But what if they were to react in a different ratio? So what if we were to take two hydrogen molecules to react with that one oxygen molecule and make two molecules of water instead? We haven't changed anything's identities or whatever. We've just adjusted the ratios of what's reacting. And if you count those up now, We've got four H's on the left and two O's, four H's on the right and two O's. So, we, so that's really what the problem was. When you see this thing look, that looks like atoms are disappearing, it really just means that things are out of balance or, out of, or in the wrong ratio. And how this reaction really goes is that two molecules of, water, of hydrogen have to react with one molecule of oxygen, and then that's going to form two molecules of water. The way we express that in the reaction itself is by putting numbers out front, uh, out in front of the um, molecules like this. And if there's no number out in front, we assume that just means one, that there's one. So if we write it with those numbers out in front, saying that we have two hydrogen molecules instead of just one, now we've avoided that problem. And that's called a balanced chemical equation. All right, so some, some equations, maybe this one, maybe you saw it, maybe you didn't. Some equations you can look at and say, okay, I can adjust this this way and, and make it work. But a lot of them are a little too complicated for that. So we're gonna go through more of a procedure of how to make sure that you can always do this and, and what to do. If you've done this in a class before and it worked and you're good at it, um, just stick with what you know. But if you haven't or you've had trouble with it, uh, I'm gonna show you another way Another way of going about this. All right, so let's um, look at this reaction. So what's the name of that first compound? Close. What's missing there? It's iron sulfide, but something's missing. Yeah, what's the charge on iron there? It's three, right? Three plus three? Because sulfide is minus two. So it's iron three sulfide. So iron three sulfide reacts with, what's HCl? Hydrochloric acid to form iron three chloride and hydrogen sulfide, H2S, I guess. All right, so we look at this reaction and the first thing we wanna do when we see a uh, an equation like this is to see if it is balanced or not because sometimes they are, sometimes they aren't. So a good way to do that is to just take an inventory of all the atoms on each side of the equation. I've got, uh, on this side I've got iron, sulfur, hydrogen, chlorine. Same thing over here. Doesn't matter what 
order you write them in, but it's helpful if you keep them on, in the same order on both sides so you can compare. And then I'm just going to count up how many I have. Um, so I've got two iron on this side, three sulfur, one hydrogen, and one chlorine. On this side, I've got an iron, a sulfur, two hydrogen, and three chlorine. So we can compare numbers on both sides and see pretty clearly that that is not balanced, right? Different numbers for each atom on, the, on different sides. Okay, so to bring this into balance, what we want to do is adjust those coefficients, those numbers out front, in order to bring them in balance. And since there's so many things going on here, we can't just kind of look at that and say, oh, well, it's, uh, I'm going to put a 3 here and a 7 here or whatever. There's too many things going on. So we're going to go step by step, balance one thing at a time, see what changes, and then kind of continue on from there. Um, I wrote down the iron first, so we'll start there. It doesn't really matter where you start. If you want to start with something else, you can start with something else. It still works. But we can look at the left side and the right side and say we've got two iron on the left, one on the right. So how do we need to change this equation to make the same number on each side? What would you do? How can we adjust those ratios by putting a number out in front to bring those into balance, to make the same number of iron on, on, each, on both sides? Yeah, we're going to put a 2 in front on the right side. Okay. So now we readjust our calculation. And instead of one iron, we have two. But we've also changed the chlorine, because we can only change numbers of whole compounds. We can't affect the individual parts, the individual atoms of the compound. So if we change the iron, we also change the chlorine from 3 to 6. See that? Because now we've got two of those compounds, each compound having three um, chlorine atoms. All right. So we balance the iron. We see that there's two on each side now. What do you want to balance next? Chlorine. Chlorine, sure. So we've got one over on the left and six on the right. How do we fix that? Yeah, we're going to put a six in front of the HCl so that we can have six chlorine. But what else does that change? The hydrogen, right. OK. Uh, what about what next? Yeah, we want to get from our six hydrogen on the left, two on the right. So if we want to get six on both sides, we've got to put a three here. And that changes this to six and this to three. And now everything is in balance. Can you see that? That works? OK, great. All right, you try one. So when I write these down, and this is kind of a good habit to get into, leave a little bit of space between the plus sign and the next thing. Um, that way, when you write in those numbers, you have some room. Also, as we'll see, there's a bit of trial and error involved in some of these. You got to kind of bounce back and forth and try some different numbers sometimes. Um, your first, first pass through doesn't always work. That's OK. Um, just leave yourself room or use a pencil or something so that uh, you don't get into trouble with that. So here's a combustion of butane. See if you can balance that one. So set up your inventory. I'm going to give you one hint here, because we haven't talked about this. The previous one I said, it doesn't matter where you start, what you balance first, second, whatever. And that was true for that one. This one, it's not exactly true, and here's why. Whenever you have a situation where you have the same kind of atom in more than one compound on the same side, so like in this case, there's oxygen in two different molecules on the same side. You want to save that till last. Otherwise, it can cause some trouble. Because 
If you try to balance it earlier, you don't really know which one you should change. And also, when you change other stuff, you're always going to affect that again. So you're going to have to mess with it later anyway. So best to just leave it till the end. Yeah. Do you add those two together for the total? Yeah, so you would add those together for the total and say there's three total oxygens on the right. It's not always going to be oxygen, but if there's any atom that is in multiple things, leave that till till the end um, so you don't run into trouble. All right, see if you can balance this one. You may find, as you work through this, that you get into trouble in one spot. Uh, it doesn't seem to quite work out. See if you can come up with a solution, or just stay tuned and we'll talk about it. Um, yes. Yeah. I mean, yes and no. All right. I'll just wait. <laughs> it's better if you can do it in whole numbers. So these are the ratios I got. Did anybody get into trouble? Get it to not work? Or did you come up with a way to get it to work? Maybe. What? OK. Um, so I've got these numbers. I'm going to go, it doesn't matter if I start with C or H. What did you start with? C. C? OK. We'll start there. Um, so we want to get 4 on the right. That's going to change this to 4, but it also changes the oxygen to 9. And there's a good example of why you wouldn't start with oxygen, because as soon as you change the C or the H, the O is going to change too. All right, so then we can do the H's, 10 on the left, 2 on the right. So that means we need a 5 here, so we can get 10 on the right also. That also changes our oxygen. So now instead of 9, we have 13. So we've got 13 oxygen on the right, 2 on the left. Uh, what do we put in front of that oxygen to get to 13? Yeah. Right. I mean, we could put like 13 halves, but like I said, it's better to have whole numbers because um, you can't split a molecule in half. So what do we do? We get to the higher than those numbers. 
Yeah, that means that we're going to have to go higher than these numbers. Um, that, the, that, that we're not going to be able to do it in this ratio because we made an assumption here. Uh, anybody know what the assumption is that we made when we started balancing this that wasn't necessarily true? Yeah, we assumed that exactly that that C4H10 that we started with was going to just stay at one. But since we ran into this trouble, that means that's not true. So when you run into this issue, which comes up relatively often, it means that the thing that you didn't change at the beginning actually needs to be changed. So the easiest way to fix this is to just double everything. Because then everything still stays in balance. All the work you already did is still done. So we can change this one to 2, and this one to 8, and this one to 10. And that way, our carbon and hydrogen should still be in balance. So instead of four Cs, we now have eight on each side. And instead of 10 hydrogens, we now have 20 on each side. And, so, and now, if we, if we add up our oxygen again, uh, we've got 16 plus 10 is 26. And that we can get by putting a 13 here. And now it works. Joe, how do you know which state the matter is? Like gas, liquid, solid? Good question. You don't. So, yeah, I would have to say that in the description. Like, this is a gas, or this is a solid, or whatever. Um, that comes with experience. So, like, the more of these that we see, the more you'll know, oh, that's probably a gas or a solid or something. But you can't know necessarily just from seeing re re reagents because you don't know. And I mean, this it's temperature dependent too. Like these are all gases, but if this were done really cold, they might be all liquids. So um, yeah, you, you can't know. Right. Okay. Now the other thing that you'll see um, with reactions like this is they're not always going to be written in this nice way. They're not always going to be kind of laid out for you and you just have to fill in the numbers. A lot of times reactions are, are given in a descriptive way, which means with words. So let's try one of those. Sodium phosphate Reacts with magnesium chloride to form magnesium phosphate. and sodium chloride. So let's say that's your reaction. See if you can write a balanced equation for that reaction.
So one thing you'll find is that you have to write the formulas down. And if you don't get the formulas right, then the balancing isn't going to work either, because that's going to dictate how you balance it. So go ahead and you know, do your best. If you find that it's not balancing, that's usually a clue that one of your formulas is wrong. Because if one of the formulas is wrong, it may, may not, um, it may not be possible to balance the, the reaction. Or it may only balance with super giant crazy numbers that you can't even get to. Did we get a re an equation to balance? Not yet. Phosphate PO4, um, is, does that mean there's four of them? Four oxygen. Four. One phosphorus and four oxygen, yeah. So let's take a look at the formulas here. Go ahead and keep, keep balancing. But these are the correct formulas. All right, so four different formulas you had to get there. Now normally, in the last chapter, if you got like three out of four, I would have said, good job, you got three out of four. You know, three out of four points or whatever. The problem now is having one of those wrong is gonna throw off this whole reaction. So we gotta be better about that and try to really get every one. Um, so let's start counting and, and see what happens. Now, when I balance equations like this, rather than have five different things, Na, P, O, Mg, and Cl, that would work, and you can totally do it that way, and it's fine. 
But you can also recognize that PO4 doesn't change over the course of this reaction. It switches what it's with, but it's still PO4. So anything that kind of stays a unit like that, we can balance as a unit. So we can just say how many PO4s are on this side and how many PO4s are on that side. And we can say phosphates, we can balance to, the, to whole phosphates instead of to P and O. It's not a big deal in this reaction which way you go with it, but let's say there was like a phosphate and a sulfate. Phosphate's PO4, sulfate's SO4, so your oxygen count's gonna get weird because you're always changing one or the other. If you keep it as phosphate and sulfate, it might be easier. It doesn't always help, but it can. All right, so adding these things up, we've got three and one, one and two, one and three, and two, and one. Something like that, right? Okay, so clearly not in balance. Uh, let's start balancing it. Three sodiums on the left, so we want to get three on the right. That changes that, but it also changes the CL. One PO4 on the left, two on the right. So we want two PO4s here. That changes our PO4 to two, but it also changes our sodium to six. So now that first balancing we did of the sodium is no longer good, so we should go back and fix that. Six sodium on the left, three on the right, so we shouldn't have a six here. Let's have a, or a three here, we should have a six there. Okay. One MG to three, so we want three of those. That changes that to three, changes that to six, and now everything is balanced. Okay. Yep. Okay. So the tough part about ones like this is if you don't have the formula right, the equation isn't going to balance properly either. And the next thing we're going to do is use the balanced equation to do some calculations about quantities and how much we have and how much we need. And so if that part's off, it kind of just carries on down the line and screws everything up else out, up afterwards. So make sure you're double checking that as you go. Yeah. Would there be equations where like the PA, PO4 did get split up? Yeah, um, it's, sure, it's possible. Just, just look for it. You know, if you don't see it on both sides, then you can then you assume the P and the O as separate things. Yeah, then you would do pseudo separate things. Um, I'm trying to think where that would be the case. Yeah, I, I don't know if we'll see many of those or not. Usually they'll probably stay together. All right. So it feels sort of okay with that so far? At least the balancing part, the equation part, maybe? This stuff takes practice. Um, as you get quicker with it, you may not even have to write down these things, these uh, like inventories. You can just kind of go back and forth and bounce from one side to another and, and change things until it works. But again, this um, I, I know I've talked to a couple people since the last exam. It's really a different class experience for a lot of you who have been successful in biology and those kinds of classes. You can't just study your notes and like read stuff and expect to get it. You have to really practice. You have to go through the practice problems and just do it over and over again. It's more like it's more like a skill than like a knowing things in your brain. You know, it's like drawing or music or something. You have to just practice it and work it out until you've done it enough that it's comfortable and, and you know what you're doing. Um, especially with these kinds of things. And the next thing we're about to do, there's only like a couple different ways this could even be asked on an exam. So if you do it a bunch of times, there's almost no way you haven't seen it before. Um, if you go through all the homework and everything. So um, that can be really helpful, but it does mean you have to do all that stuff to get ready. Okay, um, the next part is talking about chemical quantities or how we like measure things in, in chemistry. And that's gonna tie back to the equations, but it also means um, we get to eat some M&Ms. So um, should be good, I guess. All right, so first thing we have to talk about with that is that molecules and atoms are really small. Do you know that? I think probably you did. Um, that presents a problem. 
because these ratios that we've talked about here are counts. So we're saying, if we look like at this one, for that reaction to work, that little reaction to work, we need two molecules of C4H10, of butane, and 13 molecules of oxygen. To get this reaction to work properly, we have to have those ratios. But molecules are so small that we essentially can't do that. Like, there's no tiny tweezers. Well, there kind of are now. But we don't really, it's not really efficient for us to have some tiny tweezers that we can say, like, pick two of these out, and then pick 13 of these out, and put them together to react. Um, and then do that enough times to actually have a reasonable quantity. It's not possible. So what do we do instead? How can you count something that is so small you can't even see it? Yeah, what does that mean? Okay, what does that mean? <laughs> okay. Yeah, so you're on the right track. Um, but let's think about what that means. So, yeah, we need some way of thinking about tiny things. We need, we need some way of collecting so many tiny things that it becomes a quantity that we can actually deal with in our life. Because one or two or 13 or even a million or even a billion atoms or molecules is too small to even work with. Like, even the greatest microscopes, except for electron microscopes, can't see that. So, um, so we need a way to think about molecules, not just in their individual numbers, but to count them in a really big way. So has anybody ever done, like, a guess how many jelly beans are in the giant jar type contest? Has anybody ever seen, like, an enormous one of those? That was a huge thing. Um, or has anybody ever won one? Anybody ever guess, like, got the closest number to a million? You got one? Yeah. What'd you win? Uh, what'd you win? Uh, a piece of candy. Just a piece of candy? Yeah. It was a jar with, like, 30 of them. Oh. Yeah. Well, that's not too, that's not too, so exciting. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I still, I, I ask all the time, but I want to see, because, you know, they have, the, I've seen them a couple times. There's, like, a giant statue full of gummy bears or jelly beans or something. And then if you win, you, like, get it. Like, what would you even do with that? I saw it was a container that was probably as tall as this room with the nerds. Oh, yeah. wow. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, I'll open this up. Because I'm an emblem work that way, too. Oh, they have cute little Halloween designs on them. Um, so, once all those guesses are counted, and, you know, they've got all kids guess however many things there are, do you think that, like, some poor employee has to go through and actually count all the jelly beans in that giant thing? No. Probably not. So how do you think they figure out how many are in there? Wait. Yeah, exactly, they weigh it. And so that's exactly what we do with molecules, because we can't count them, they're too small. But if we know how many of them are in a certain amount of weight, then we can weigh them and see. So let's try that with jelly beans. So I've got a pack of, or not jelly beans, M&Ms. I've got a pack of M&Ms, which I think every year there are like fewer M&Ms in the packs. There's like not that many in here. It's not as exciting of a demonstration as I, I thought it would be. Um, but all right. So let's say there are so many M&Ms in here that we can't even count them. Or we're just really bad counters or something. Um, so one way that we can count them is by weighing. So let's try that. Uh, I have a scale here. It's becoming more and more apparent that this is not that great of a demonstration, but just an excuse to eat m so <laughs> it's fine. All right, so how, while well, that's getting started, how can we count the M&Ms in this package by weighing instead of by counting? Yeah, we're going to weigh one, and we're going to weigh all of them, and divide. OK, there's my scale, my nice tiny scale, which is for chemistry. I think most people who have these, it's not for chemistry. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> all right. So one of them weighs, yeah, I guess it's, it's chemistry adjacent, right? Um, so one of them weighs, according to my little non-drug scale, 
0.8 grams, 0.9 grams. Hit shut off. Um, all right, so we'll say we'll say point. We'll say that was an um, uncertain digit, so we'll say 0.8 grams. Sound good? So one M&M &M weighs 0.8 grams. OK. Let's see how much a pack of M&Ms weighs. Okay. 13 grams. All right. So by that calculation, then. How much does the bag weigh? Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I'll just check that. I think it's probably immeasurable, like under. Oh no, it's about 0.7 also. So the bag weighs about one M's M and M's worth. So one M and M was about point. What do we say? 0.8 grams. The bag alone is 0.7 grams, and then the full bag is what did I say? 13. OK, so one way we might do this is like a conversion problem is we could say, because you know, this is kind of like some of those weird problems they had in, in chapter 2. But we could say that there are 0 0.8 grams per one m, m So 0.8 grams per count per m, m So if we have. Let's just do our subtraction here. Our full bag minus the bag is going to be 12.3 grams, right? So if we have 12.3 grams uh, mass of the full bag, we can multiply that by a factor that cancels, oops, not M &M, that cancels grams and instead gets us M&Ms. using that factor that there are 0.8 grams per m and And this tells us 12.3 uh, divided by 0.8. 15.375, which is obviously not a whole number. Um, but we could say, let's say 15 m and in the bag. Right, with a plus or minus one because it's an uncertain digit. All right, so who wants to check? Ah, uh, sort of close. Do you think they're consistent through bags? Anybody else want to check? I mean, I heard somebody. You ready? Just wait. I'm up here for the right time. Too. Oh, that was terrible. That one caught some air. I feel like Oprah now. <laughs> All right. Well, if anybody else wants any but didn't speak up, you can come get some. There's also some other kinds because we're going to talk about those too. So let's see how many M&Ms are in that bag. You said 14. 14 in that one. Okay, so that's within that within our margin of error. You got 15 in yours? I got 15. 15? I have 15. 15. So you got shorted a bag, <laughs> or shorted an M&M in your bag. So about 15. So we were able to count the M&Ms. <laughs> what? I got 15. Oh, well, yeah. Um, I mean, these are probably done by weight at the factory, because they don't yeah. count, right? So there's some standardization. Um, maybe yours got... <laughs> we got 15 point something. Chunky. Oh, you got a little extra <laughs> <laughs> nub in yours? <laughs> it's good. I hope it's food and not like something gross. <laughs> um, all right, so point is we were able to count the M&Ms by weighing them, right? Um, and in fact, we could. I also like, you know, they're actually getting more reasonable with serving size now. The serving size is three packs. Which is probably. <laughs> About right, right? I don't think anybody eats 15 m and and is like, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we were able to count the M&Ms. Um, so what happens if we change to peanut m &Ms? Mm -hmm. 
So first of all, does it say? Okay, so here's our peanut M&Ms. Same thing, what changes? The weight of each one, right? So um, let's do these in, in reverse. Let's see if we can figure out how much an M&M &M weighs by weighing the package and counting them, and then see if we're right. Okay? So I'm going to weigh the package. I think we can probably assume that the actual packaging is the same as before. I don't know. We'll see if we're, we're off or not. I'm going to weigh this, and one package of M&Ms um, in the bag is, or peanut M&Ms, yeah. Um, full bag with the bag is 19.2 grams. Okay, who wants to count them? So we'll say, uh, while you're doing that, we'll do our, do our subtraction and say the full bag minus the bag itself. Um, if the bag is still 0.7, is going to be 18.5 grams. So how many you got? Eight. Eight. Okay. So if we have eight M&Ms, and that should be 18.5 grams, or here, let's set it up like a conversion again. Um, well, 18.5 grams per bag, and then eight per bag. I guess it doesn't make as much sense to do it that way this time. So 18.5 divided by 8 is uh, 2, should be 2.3 grams per one peanut m &M. Okay, let's see if we're right. Pretty good, right? 2.2? And I think these are a little less standardized because peanuts are not as uh, homogeneous. Yeah, two point five. So, so we're gonna, we're getting a little bit more variation in that, right? All right. Did anybody else want some that didn't get them? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I read like seeing. Why did you just come up here and grab some? There's pretzel ones too. <laughs> oh, the pretzel ones are so good. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's just like a disaster of M&Ms up here. So. Um, okay. So that's the idea that we can we can count things by weighing them. And the same way we can weigh by counting them. So if we know how many of something we have, and we know the mass of each of them, we can figure out the total mass. That's like that's basic stuff. But more importantly, we can count things that are too small. Um, like we could take, we won't actually maybe check ourselves. So let's take four packages of M&Ms. These are the plain ones. Weigh them all together. Four bags is 56.8 grams. Okay. Um, we can subtract four times the weight of each bag, which was 0.7 grams. Uh, which is 56.8 minus 
2.8, so that'd be 53. 54, yep. Thanks. So 54 grams uh, worth of M&Ms in four bags. We can take those 54 grams, multiply that by our um, unit of 0.8 grams per m and m and get we'll say 67 or 68 with what we figured before was 15 m and m's so we do something wrong or am i just because 15 times 4 would be 60, right? That's what we counted. So what do we do wrong here? Do I actually have 5 here? Nope, that's 4. Um, I don't know. But anyway, it didn't work out. <laughs> but uh, not as standard as we... Yeah. Yeah, I could have grabbed the package that had some extras in it or something. 14. It should have been 52 grams. It was uh, each bag weighed 13 grams. Yeah, they're, they're not as standardized as I thought because they're all the way from 13 to 15, depending on the bag. So they're not quite as even. Um, but, you know, within... <laughs> We got like sort of in the range at least. And if we're talking about molecules, honestly, that's great, right? Because we're talking about un unimaginably large numbers of molecules in even the tiniest speck that we can see because they're just so small. So, you know, even if we're getting close. And the other way that we could do that better um, is if we had more significant figures, if we had a more sensitive balance like upstairs. Um, and then the more, the more we sampled, like, let's say, rather than just weighing one M&M, &M, we should probably weigh 10 different M&Ms and take the average of all of them, right? And then we'd have a better sense of what each, each one is. So, um, so we, can, we can count pretty large numbers of things by weighing it, and that's just what we're going to do with molecules. So the same idea... The difference is for atoms and molecules is because we can't weigh them directly on like on a balance because they're so small, we have to think of a factor to like multiply them by. So since let's say I, like one M and M was right at the detection limit of my balance, right? It was like just at the bottom. So probably would have been better if we could count M and M's by the ten, and we could say okay, ten M and M's weighs this, and and then count things that way. We'd probably have a better we probably have a better time of it with that with that tool. So for atoms and molecules, they're so small that we need a giant mod, a giant number. So we need to multiply quantities by this huge number. 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. Um, we'll just say our world. I don't. I don't. I mean, I can't think of a better word. But like, obviously, they're in our world. Um, but we need to have way more of them before we can sort of kind of even deal with how many there are. So the number that was that was um, developed is called Avogadro's number. And it's 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. That's a 6 with then 23 more digits behind it. So a crazily huge number, yeah. How did this guy figure out this number? It's a um, microscopic. 
It's a good question. It, it comes from this idea of the isotopes and kind of how we wanted to standardize it. So how that number works is if you have that many of a particular atom, it changes its, its, its um, atomic mass units, which are those tiny, tiny fractions of a gram that you can weigh an atom by, into actual grams that we can weigh. So if we look up on the periodic table, if we took an atom of carbon-12, an atom of just one atom of carbon-12, which means it has six protons and six neutrons, right? And that weighs 12 atomic mass units. That many carbon atoms, that many carbon-12 atoms, weighs 12 grams. So it changes it from that scale to the gram scale. Now, we know that we can't, well, we can, but we usually don't have pure carbon-12. We have a mixture of different isotopes. So that many of carbon atoms, like in general, where there's some carbon-12, some carbon-13, is going to weigh 12.011 grams. So that's the number, those red numbers on the periodic table are the mass of that many atoms of that particular element. And so that number is given a particular name. And it's called a mole. And the mole is not really a unit. It's a number. It's a quantity. It's best compared to something like a dozen. You know what a dozen is? How many? Twelve, right? So if we say a dozen of something, we mean twelve. If we say a mole of something, we mean that many. It works the exact same way. It's just a way bigger number. Um, but sometimes, if you're dealing with counts of things, it may, those, not those words that we use to express a number make sense and are helpful because then we can talk about them in a more reasonable way. Like if you're selling a bunch of donuts, it makes more sense to say, like, I want two dozen donuts instead of saying, I want 24 donuts because that's just the number that they work in. And you could talk about a half dozen or a quarter dozen. I don't want to say like a fifth of a dozen, we might throw somebody off, but, um, but it's the same thing with mole. We don't want to say, uh, oh, we've got 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd carbon atoms every time we need a quantity of carbon atoms, so we just say, oh, we got a mole of them, or we need a mole of them, or we need half a mole, or two moles, or three moles, or whatever. And we can use that for our um, quantities if we go back to this reaction. So. Our first problem that we that we couldn't solve, where we said we need to count two of these out, that's basically impossible to do. But we can count two moles of those out, because that's in the quantity we can actually weigh. And we can figure out how much of each thing we need um, to do those calculations. So we'll do one part of this and then we'll and then we'll stop and take a break. So we use this term molar mass, also known as molecular weight. Or molar weight, or something like that. And that's the mass in grams. of one mole, which is 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd, of something, anything. So if you have a mole of whatevers, the mass of that is called the molar mass. Uh, here are some other examples, some non M&M non type examples. And you can, let's maybe not put these by the food. Um, you can come check these out. I, there's nothing really bad in here, I guess. But, oh, there is, yeah, actually. Um, there's one. Uh, so these different atoms have different molar masses. So um, in each example, this test tube has one mole of this particular um, element. So this one is carbon. 
which is a black powder. We know it as graphite, but it's, it's carbon. This one is copper. If you look up on the periodic table, the molar mass of carbon is 12.011 grams. So that means that there are this many atoms of carbon in here, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd, and that's how much it weighs. Copper's molar mass, if we look at the red number under copper, number 29, is 63.546. So that means that many atoms of copper are going to be heavier, and you can feel they are heavier. Um, there's also lead in here, which is much, much, much heavier, because if we look at lead uh, down number 82, one mole is 207.2 grams. So the same number of atoms in, in each of those three tubes, but the mass is very different because each atom weighs different among those, uh, those three different elements. You can also have the molar mass of a compound. It's pretty easy. You just add up the individual masses. So for like C4H10 from that problem before, we can find how many, if we have 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd molecules of C4H10, we can figure out how much that's going to weigh by adding up the carbon and the hydrogen. Whoops, sorry. So we've got four carbons, and each carbon is 12... 0.011. Oops. And then we've got 10 hydrogens, and each hydrogen is 1.0. I'll just say So the molar mass of butane, C4H10, is 58.14 grams in a mole. That means if we weighed out 58.14 grams, we've counted out exactly 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd molecules of C4H10. So to get that, um, notice I dropped the E off that mole. The abbreviation for mole is M-O-L, so it's not a great abbreviation, sorry. Um, M is meters, M-O is months, so that was the best that we could do. M-L is milliliters, so M-O-L is the abbreviation for mole. So in this way, we can count things by weighing them, um, and that's important for a reaction. So if we, want to, if we want to do this reaction, and we want to do it exactly in the quantities listed there, we might need, say, okay, we, let's measure out 2 moles of butane and 13 moles of oxygen. And then we know we have the right ratio because they're counted properly. So to do that, we'd have to weigh out 58, or whatever that number was, of, of the butane. And then whatever we calculate for the oxygen, 13 of those. Um, or sorry, we need double that 58 number and then 13 oxygens. And then we know we'd have the right ratio. Um, so the, the, what we're going to do next after the break is talk about how we do that um, in a practical way. Do you have a question? Okay. Any other questions before we stop? Yeah. Where did you get the butane? Where is the butane? That oh, that's the C4H10. Okay. That's, what that, that's what that's called. Sorry. Yeah, that's what that's called. All right. Um, let's take 15 minutes or so. And we'll come back, grab more M&Ms if you want.
Okay. All right. Um, so the ultimate point of, of doing all this then is so that we can count these things enough to set up these reactions. Because if you have, let's look at it like look back at our very first one. In order for hydrogen and oxygen to react properly, properly, we need two molecules of hydrogen for every one molecule of oxygen. But as we talked about, we can't count them, so we have to weigh them to count them um, and talk about it in terms of moles. So what we can do is something like this. Let me rewrite that equation. All right. So we could just say... We have two, let's get two moles of hydrogen, react them with one mole of oxygen, and make two moles of water. Uh, what would that look like? So we could say two moles of this plus one mole of that, and we would expect to get two moles of that, right? That's what those numbers in the equation tell us. That's why we balance the equation, so that we can um, do something like this. Now we can figure that out in terms of mass. How much does one mole of hydrogen weigh? Of hydrogen molecules weigh? That's true for a hydrogen atom. What about for a hydrogen molecule? Double that, right? Because there's two of them. Yeah. Because it's H2. So what we would do is we'd say, all right, we need two moles of hydrogen. So two moles of hydrogen. And we do it just like the conversion problems from back in chapter two. We get rid of moles, and instead we have grams. And what is the factor that gives us grams per mole, or how many grams are in a mole? It's just the molar mass. So this thing right here, this term, this conversion factor, is our molar mass. We're going to cut off a couple decimal places just to make it easy uh, or a little bit easier for us. Like I said in this class, we're not really going to be too worried about that. So we'll just call that 2.02 grams per mole. Two hydrogens. Two 1.01s is 2.02. OK, so then that means 4.04 grams. OK, so now we just calculated how much hydrogen we have to measure to do this reaction in this ratio. We can't count the hydrogen molecules. We can't weigh the individual molecules because they're too small. But we can weigh two moles of them because 4.04 4 grams, that's like an amount that we've weighed in lab before. Yeah. You weigh gas. Yes. Well, that, that does make it trickier, yeah. Um, you can. Um, it's a little tougher when the gas is lighter than air because you can't use a scale um, because it doesn't like sit down. If it's heavier than air, like carbon dioxide, you can weigh that just by putting it in a balloon or something and then letting it sit on the scale. Um, hydrogen is a little bit, a little bit trickier, so we'll get into that when we talk about gases. Um, basically, you have to measure the pressure and the volume, and you can get it from that. But let's just say we can measure it. Let's pretend we have a magical scale that we can measure the hydrogen on. Um, but it's a good point. Yeah, you can't really measure hydrogen. Okay, so now let's do the same thing for oxygen. We need one mole of O2, we want to cancel moles and instead have grams. And what's the mass of one mole of O2? What's the molar mass of O2? 32, right. Yeah, two sixteens.
Okay. So this tells us we measure our 4.04 grams of hydrogen. We measure our 32 grams of oxygen. We react those two together, and we make how much water? Two moles. So we can calculate the mass. We can calculate how much water we expect to make in the same way. The equation tells us that based on these ratios, we would expect to make two moles of water. That's what that number out in front means. So let's try it. What's the molar mass of water? Oxygen 16, so 18, we'll say 0 0.02. So when this reaction is all done, we would expect to make 36 or so grams of water. Notice that that is also, you can also get that number from adding up the other two numbers because conservation of mass, right? If we don't lose anything in the course of the reaction, which we know we can't, then, and that's our only product, then that's what we should make. And all that mass should become water. And the goal is that, that that does happen. All right, so that's fine if we're only using the quantities that are called for in the particular reaction. But let's say we don't want to make 36 grams of water. Let's say we want to make 72 grams. What would we do? Couldn't you multiply it all by two? Yeah, so I picked an easy number. You could just double everything, right? It's just like cooking. If you want to make a giant cake instead of a little cake, you can just double everything. Or a mini cake or whatever, I don't know. I'm not that good at making cakes. Um, <laughs> maybe that wouldn't work. You're all going to be like, that wouldn't work at all. Um, but yeah, so let's try that. Because in a, in a more real situation, we either have a particular amount that we want to make of something, or we have a particular amount that we want to use of something to then do that reaction. So let's pick one of our other reactions. Let's pick that butane one again, because we were um, looking at that before. So that was 2C4H10, oops, plus 13O2. Okay. This is called combustion. We're going to talk about the types of reactions later, but um, this is burning butane. Butane is a, a hydrocarbon fuel like used in lighters, and you can burn it with oxygen. But one thing you might need to calculate is how much oxygen do you actually need to burn a given amount of butane? Because if you don't have enough oxygen, it's not going to burn properly. If you have too much, you're going to have leftover oxygen. So let's say we want to know exactly how much oxygen it takes to burn a certain amount of butane. So somebody think of a number. Six. OK, so let's say we have six grams of butane. How much oxygen does it take to react with six grams of butane? Now, this is a question that is going to have a couple steps to it because what's the molar mass of butane? Um, let's calculate it. So carbon is 12. We'll just stick to the whole numbers because um, we're dealing with bigger things now. So carbon is 12. 4 times 12 is 48 plus 10 because hydrogen is 1 is 58. Yeah? Oh, yeah, we calculated that before too, right? So C4H10 is, we'll say, 58 grams per mole. And oxygen is, we already did that one before, 32 grams per mole. So if we only need 6 grams, that's way less than a mole, right? 
So we can't just say, oh, we need two moles of this and 13 of this, because we need way less than two. We need some fraction. So we need to figure out what fraction of a mole we need, and then we can figure out how much oxygen we need. All right. It's kind of like, um, uh, if we go back to the M&Ms, if you're making something with M&Ms, and we know a bag of M&Ms weighs whatever it weighs, but you need less than that, you need to figure out what portion of that bag you need, you need right? or what portion of the dozen that you need. Um, so we can do that by converting units again. So we'll say 6 grams of C4H10. And this time we want to convert from grams to moles. So we want to know how many moles is this 6 grams that we're using. If we follow the units, we don't have to worry about, oh, I, do I need to multiply or do I need to divide? You just put the units in the right place, put the numbers with them, and then you're good. So grams go on the bottom, so the 58 goes on the bottom. 6 divided by 58 is 0 0.103. So we'll say 0 0.103 moles of C4H10. So about a tenth of a mole. Butane. Oh, okay. So that's how many six grams is 0.103 moles of butane. Okay. So that's however many that 6.02 times 10 to my third number. That a tenth of that is how many we need for this reaction because we only need six grams. So the next question is then. Over here. Let's let's write these down so we stay organized. So first question. How many moles in six grams of C4H10? And that's what we just figured, that's what we just calculated. Because the reaction, the way molecules work, requires counting, not weighing. So we have to go from a weight to a count, and the moles is a count. That's why we do that first step. Second step is, now that we know how many C4H10s we need to count, 0.1 moles, how many oxygens do we need how many moles of O2 are then needed to react with that? How do you think we figure that out? Yeah. The balanced equation tells us that butane and oxygen always react in a 2 to 13 ratio. So we always have two of these for 13 of these. So we can think of that as another type of a conversion. We need to go from moles of C4H10, which is what we have, to moles of O2, which is what we want. And the numbers from the equation tell us to what to fill in there. The equation tells us that for every two moles of that, we need 13 of this. But they always react in that 2 to 13 ratio. If you set it up like this, like a regular fraction, just like all the conversion problems from before, you don't need to remember which top gets which number or bottom. Just have them have the units in the right place and copy down the numbers right from the balanced equation. And, that's, uh, and then the, that'll be right. So we can calculate that. 0 0.103 times 13 divided by 2. Um, let's we'll say 0 0.670, 0 0.670 moles of O2. Okay, so now we know how much O2 is needed for that quantity of butane. But there's one more step. 
Because remember, we can't count moles. We can't pick out individual oxygens. So we need to know how much massive oxygen we need for that quantity. So the third question is, how much How much oxygen is that in grams? So the final step is to convert moles of oxygen to grams of oxygen. Is that where you use the six point zero two? No, we're never going to use that number because we're not going to actually count the individual ones. We're always just going from moles to grams. The only time we would use that number is if I wanted to know how many actual molecules of O2 do we need. And, and like, that's a question that will be in the homework and you'll see a little bit, but like from a practical standpoint, that's not really an important number because we're not actually going to count however many bazillions of oxygen that is. We're going we're gonna to weigh it. So this time, We want to go from moles of oxygen to grams of oxygen. So we're going to use the molar mass of oxygen that tells us there's 32 grams in one mole. So if we go back up to our equation here, we've calculated through that three-step process, we've calculated that for six grams of butane, we need 21.4 grams of oxygen. Now we can go into the lab, take our six grams of butane, take our 21.4 grams of oxygen, put them together, and have a good reaction that doesn't have leftovers. So that's the process. Yeah? What would happen if you did take, like, just, like, random stuff and screw it together? Um, that's a good question. You'd have, you'd have um, leftovers is basically what it would, what it would be. Um, that is possible, then. It works, yeah, okay. but you'd have less of it. So let's say, like, um, one of the exam and we're I think the book talks about this, but we're going to skip over this part for the for this class because it becomes a more difficult calculation. But let's say you're making that's a good thing pizza. Do you know Do you know about pizza? Okay, so <laughs> let's say our pizza takes one crust, uh, two jars of sauce, and three bags of cheese. It's a very cheesy pizza, or a very small bag. So. So one, one crust, two bags, two packages of sauce, and, and uh, three bags of cheese. All right, so that's the perfect ideal ratio. If you had one thing of each, if you had one crust, one thing of sauce, and one thing of cheese, you can only make a third of a pizza, because you only have a third as much cheese, so everything else is limited. So you'd have leftover crust, you'd have leftover sauce, you would use up um, all your cheese, but then you have leftovers. Same idea with chemicals. Or if you had three of each, if you had three crusts, three jars of cheese, and, or three jars of sauce, and three bags of cheese, you'd make one whole pizza with the one, two, threes, then you'd have one leftover jar of sauce, and two left right, and, and two leftover crusts. Yeah, right, so exactly. So that's what you'd have in these situations. If you just kind of threw stuff together, whatever you had the least amount of ratio-wise, that's what would determine what you get, and then everything else would just be left over. It so wouldn't get used. Still create the right. Yeah. So like in this example, the equation tells us that for every two of these, we need 13 of these. So we got 0.103 moles of this, 0.67 moles of this. If we had like 
0.8 moles of this one instead, we'd still get the same amount of products. We just have a little bit left over of this. But if we had less than 0.67, then we wouldn't use up all this, and we'd have some of that left over. So that, that's what would happen. And you can calculate exactly like how much would be left over and stuff, um, but we're not, we're not going to do that. We're going to focus on this, this technique of figuring out how much you need. Um, this can also be done, and we're going to do some other examples of this, with the products. So we can say, um, in fact, let's do that now. If we start with that same six grams of butane, how much carbon dioxide do we make? It's the exact same calculation. I mean, it's the exact same process, but with the numbers from the carbon dioxide instead. So let's do that. Um, I want to show you the other way to do this, which a lot of people think is a little easier. So I'm going to copy this over. Okay. So now we're going to say, instead of how much oxygen do we need, how much carbon dioxide do we want, do we, uh, are we going to make? Now the neat thing about this calculation, it's, it's a little complicated. I know it's quarter after eight, your brains are probably a little fried by this stuff at this point. But as you practice it, this is the only kind of calculation there is. There's no like weird, tricky variations and story problems with the stuff. It's always just like this. So once you've got it and practice it a few times, or a bunch of times, or really a lot of times, depending on how much it takes, you've got it. You know there's going to be a problem like this on the exam, and it's going to be exactly what you expect it to be. There's not going to be any tricks or anything. Yeah. It's always going to be that three-step process. Too. Yeah, because you're always got to go from well, or less if if you're given like moles instead of grams or something. But if you're given grams of one thing and you want to calculate grams of another thing, it's always that same process. Because of that, we can actually string this together in one big line, just like we did with the other conversion problems. A lot of people think that that's easier than, than thinking about it in three different steps. So let's try that. We can follow the units the same way. So we go from grams of C4H10 to moles of C4H10, then to moles of CO2, and then finally to grams of CO2. So from unit to unit, canceling out the one before, just as we did with those conversion problems um, at the beginning of the semester. So we can say 6 grams C4H10. So then our next unit is going to be canceling grams of C4H10 and instead getting moles of C4H10. Okay. Just following along with that chart of, of what we're going next. Then we're canceling the moles of C4H10 to get moles of CO2. And for our final step, we're canceling moles of CO2 and getting grams of CO2. That same that same method. And then we, we'll fill in the numbers together. The one thing that, that I see that throws people off on this is wanting to skip the mole step. Remember, we can't go directly from grams of one to grams of the other because we have to count them. And we have to do this ratio so that they get counted appropriately. Um, and that's why we need that extra step. So it's got, always got to be grams to moles, moles to moles, moles to grams, always in that, that way. So that makes sure we count everything. All right, let's fill in our numbers. So we had six, we started with six grams. Um, this one was whatever it was, like fifty-eight. Why did we start with six grams? Because just... I said throw out a number, and he said six. Oh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> do Do you want to pick a different one? We can do a different one. Now. Okay. Yeah. No, it was just a yeah. Okay, uh, then we've got the moles, so we've got to get the, from these numbers from the equation. CO2, there's 8 for every 2 of uh, that one. Butane. And then carbon dioxide, molar mass, um, 12 plus 16 plus 16 is 44, right? 
Yeah, 44. Okay. So now we should be able to multiply by stuff on top, divide by the stuff on the bottom, and get our answer. So 6 divided by 58 times 8 divided by 2 times 44, 18.2. So for every six grams of butane that we use, assuming we have enough oxygen, we would expect to make 18.2 grams of carbon dioxide. Because it gets oxygen and oxygen's heavier than, hyd uh, than hydrogen. So it ends up, it's also in a two to eight ratio. So you're making eight times the moles. Um, yeah, it's the end of the bar. Okay. We should also define a term here. Lost my. What we just calculated is also known as the theoretical yield. Theoretical yield is. how much product you would make Converted to product. So, and we, we can note that that is actually this. So, if we're calculating this out and we say, um, I'm going to weigh out six grams of starting material, use enough oxygen, whatever we calculated before, how much carbon dioxide do I make? You do the calculation and you get 18.2. Now, if you actually do this in a lab, you would not get 18.2 grams of carbon dioxide because reactions aren't perfect. Stuff happens, molecules don't get with each other. Every reaction actually has a slightly amount, slight amount of backwardness to it. So some of the molecules are staying put and not reacting. Some of the ones that have reacted are going backwards and forming more starting material. So anyway, you can never actually make as much as you calculate in this. That's the absolute upper limit of what you can make. Um, and so that's called the theoretical yield, because it's not real, it's theoretical. How much would you make if everything went exactly perfectly. In an actual situation, you would get whatever you get, and then you can get what's called a percent yield, which is the percent of the theoretical yield that you actually get. So if we got half of that, if we burn this stuff up and we only get 9.1 grams, we would say we got a 50% yield. We only got half of the theoretical yield. Some reactions, that's a really good yield. That's great if you get 50%. Others, that means maybe something went wrong. Just depends on what, what you're doing. All right, um, let's practice this a little bit. Do I have the, oh, I don't have the book up. Let me get the book here. So I'll show you what kind of, uh, I'll show you what kind of problems they ask in the book, which will be very similar to what we see on quizzes and exams. This stuff will not be on the quiz on Wednesday. Wednesday will be on last week's stuff. Um, but next Monday, we'll have another quiz on this stuff. Okay, so take a look at these problem, these kinds of problems in the book. Like this one, number uh, 
Now the book is nice to you. They always give you the equation already balanced because they want you to focus on that particular problem. But once we've got, and that's great, that's, it's good for practice because it only tests you on that one thing. But by the time we get good at this and we're starting to do this on like the next exam, I would expect that all you need is that first sentence. Okay, that's not a good example because you don't necessarily know what ammonia is, but generally like a sentence like that. And then let's say this top one. So that one, all you need is that sentence and then you can answer these questions. Um, given the, the various masses, because you could set up and balance the equation yourself just given the names. But since we're just working on the quantities for now, let's take one of these. We'll use the reaction that they give us also. Okay. So let's look at part A of this, of this uh, one. If you have 3.64 grams of hydrogen, how many grams of ammonia, that's NH3, can be produced? So this is the exact same kind of calculation that we just did here. The difference is it's talking about a different reaction. But see if you can set it up in the same way and uh, get an answer for that. If you got that one, see if you can do B and C also. There are all three of those questions use the same procedure that we just did, uh, just different numbers based on which molecules are being talked about. We should start with B. Start with A. Start with and, a. But then if, if you get done, get done, go ahead and work on B and C. H2 just be two grams. Yeah, um, and, and that's a good point. When you look at the periodic table, um, how do you round and like how many decimal places you use? Since we're not really being strict with that in general, you can kind of pick. Usually, what I do is um, if I don't care that much uh, about specifically the right numbers, if it's pretty close, I'll round to the whole number. If it's like right in the middle, I'll round to 0.5. Or something, um, but it really doesn't matter. If it's multiple choice and you don't round right, you'll get something close enough, and I'll make sure that the choices are such that it's clear which one you're, you know, which one works. If it's not multiple choice, then I'll just look at what you did. And If you're getting stuck, uh, talk to people around you or flag me down. And, and 
Did anybody eat more than their three bag serving of M&Ms and start to feel terrible? If I have a bunch left over after my class tomorrow, I'll probably just eat them instead of lunch. <laughs> so that'll be an unpleasant afternoon.
How's this going? Maybe you got something. All right, keep working. I'm going to set these up um, here on the screen, and then we can talk about them if there's issues. Yeah, I got 20.6 grams of ammonia for the first one. If you got something different, take a look at what you wrote down and see where it looks different. If it's a little bit different, it could be just rounding based on how many decimal places you pulled from the periodic table. If it's a lot different, there's probably some other issue. Let's see if you can find it. Next one. Six grams of hydrogen for the next one. Okay. Can you explain that one? Yeah. Um, there we go. Okay. Uh, how many grams of H2 are needed to react with 2.8 grams of nitrogen? So if we're given one quantity, we can always find any of the other quantities in the equation using this process. So we start with that 2.8 grams of nitrogen, then we need to go to the moles. Then we need to use the ratio from the equation, which tells us there's three hydrogen for every one nitrogen. And finally, we convert the uh, moles of hydrogen into grams of hydrogen. With the mole, this is the molar mass. Okay. And that's, that's what we get. So we've got molar. We can also kind of break this up into categories here. 
based on what these things are. So this is always the molar mass. This is also a molar mass of the other one. And then that middle part is called the mole ratio. And that's the part that we get from the balanced equation. So if we ever run into a question that's asking about grams or moles, we can use this form of equation. Right. Yep. This is this is the, like the biggest that it gets. If it tells you starting with this many grams of this thing, how many grams of this thing you have, you do this whole thing out that way. Sometimes it's a little bit easier. Um, sometimes you might see a problem like this. Sorry, thought I clicked the right page, but I didn't. So notice the difference about in this uh, wording versus the last one. Same kind of thing, you've got a chemical reaction. But now the question is asking just about moles. How many moles of this one do you need for this many moles of that one? That is speaking to that mole ratio. And all we need for that is the numbers from the equation, from the balanced equation. We don't need to mess with molar masses because there's no talk of masses in this at all. So if we want to solve part A, we would say, OK, well, this one's Excuse me. Let's look at part B, because that's just exactly what it says in the equation. Let's look at part, part B. How many moles of hydrogen are needed to react with five moles of oxygen? We would say five moles of oxygen. And then we need to convert that by getting rid of moles of oxygen and instead getting moles of, hyd oh. getting moles of hydrogen, because that's what is asked for here. How many moles of hydrogen? We get those numbers then straight from the equation. Two moles of this for every one of this. And so the answer is you need 10 moles of hydrogen. And sometimes, like maybe this one, depending on what you see, you can answer that just kind of by looking at it. You can say, oh, well, I see in the equation it's a two to one ratio. So if I've got Five, I need 10, because 10 to 5 is the same as 2 to 1. If you can do that in your head and the numbers work out, that's great. If not, you can put it into an equation like this and, and calculate it. So, so that is kind of um, what we were talking about before. That is a, a good point, that when it's talking about masses, grams and grams, you want to use that procedure we just did. If it's only talking about moles, you only need to use that middle. Okay. All right, we should practice this more, and you definitely want to practice this more um, on your own. If you think you're getting it now, that's great. Uh, make sure you practice it so you don't lose it. If you are completely lost right now, that's also okay. Uh, just make sure that you get into the book and get into the practice problems and the homework to work out this out a little oh, bit. Yeah. What sections of the book did we go over last week? Sounds like weird. We finished chapter six. So that it was like six point five to the end or something like that. Yeah. It's online if you want to watch the video. And the, note, the notes are posted too. OK, the last thing that, uh, that we are going to look at in this chapter, which will prepare us well for lab on Wednesday. Um, so we're going to keep working on this kind of stuff for the next couple weeks. Wednesday, we're going to do a bunch of chemical reactions and do some calculations around them. The following week, we're going to do a, just a couple chemical reactions, but do really careful calculations around the moles and stuff. Um, so this week, we're doing reactions that deal with uh, the types of chemical reactions.
we're going to look at four different types of reactions. Um, not just as like an exercise of, oh, here's how they fit into some categories. It's useful because it allows us to predict what's going to happen. If you know which category your reaction fits in, you can make a pretty good guess as to what the products are going to be. And that's kind of a powerful thing, to know what's going to happen when you mix things together is one of the goals of chemistry, or one of the, app, you know, one of the applications of chemistry. So in that way, we can do this. So I'm going to show you the types. We're going to see all of these types in a uh, lab on Wednesday. So the first type. Combination or composition reaction. And I have this kind of generic notation for what this thing looks like, but usually this is going to be these types of reactions. You mix some stuff together and they become one thing. Kind of like the hydrogen and oxygen one that we just saw. So you've got two reactants that come together and make one product. That's called a combination reaction. The one we're going to do on uh, Wednesday is this one. Magnesium and oxygen. Magnesium burns and oxygen to make magnesium oxide. Now notice that just because the two things go together does not mean that you just smash them together and write it down. You still have to think chemically. You have to adjust the ratios based on the ions, all that kind of stuff. When magnesium and oxygen react, they make a compound out of magnesium and oxygen. But then you have to think and realize, oh, magnesium's plus two, oxygen's plus or minus two, so they're going to make a one-to-one -one compound, MgO, not MgO2. You don't just smash those together and make MgO2. So uh, Think about that as you're doing this. Um, the ratios of the uh, cations and anions in the compounds can change. They don't stay the same on both sides of the equation. OK, the second one is called decomposition. It's just the opposite of a combination reaction. So you, you start with one compound in a decomposition reaction. And you break it into a couple pieces. These are really hard to predict because you don't know exactly how the thing is going to break apart. So the one we're going to do on um, Wednesday is we're going to heat up calcium carbonate, which decomposes into calcium oxide and then carbon dioxide gas. That's a tough one to predict if you didn't really know what was going to happen. Because if all you see is CaCO3, how do you know that it makes CaO or CaC or some up to Ca and then CO something? Like, you don't know. So that these are usually hard to predict because we just don't know. Um, the only way we can really predict those is if it says something like carbon dioxide gas it comes out. Then we can be pretty sure that the other part is the other stuff, whatever else is left over. So you usually need some clues to figure those out. Third category is kind of a has two parts. The whole category is called the replacement reactions. The two parts are Single replacement and double replacement. Single replacement looks like this. You have some element by itself, usually, that reacts with an, a compound of two other things. And then one of those pieces in the compound breaks off to go with the element, and the other one stays by itself. So something like that. And it could be A, B plus C, or whatever. It just depends on what it is. One of the pieces breaks off to go with the other one. Um, the one we're going to do on Wednesday looks like this. We're going to take zinc metal 
and react it with hydrochloric acid. And so what do you think is going to happen? You think that the, well, because we know it's a single replacement reaction, we know that what the H and the Cl are going to break apart. One of those pieces is going to go with the zinc, and one of them is going to be by itself. So which one do you think is going to go with the zinc? Yeah, the chloride. Because uh, we know that that makes a common anion. Metals are usually cations. Hydrogen can make an anion, but it's a lot less common. So our guess is going to be the chlorine is going to go with the zinc. Anybody know what the typical charge of zinc is? It's one of those weird ones. Yeah, it's, it's in the transition metals, but it always makes a plus two charge. So that's one that we maybe couldn't predict if we didn't know that. We'd know the chlorine goes with the zinc, but we might not know exactly what kind of compound that makes. So I will just tell you that it makes zinc chloride and then hydrogen gas is left over. If I did tell you that zinc chloride was the compound, would you, and this is a balance yet, would you know that H2 is the gas that has to go out, or would you write H? H2. Yeah, so make sure you keep that in mind, that those elements that we talked about that always make doubles, that always make dimers, whenever they end up by themselves in a reaction, you got to make sure to have that two there. Otherwise, they're not going to balance right, ratios aren't going to be right, and all that stuff. So, um, so let's balance this. Not too hard to balance. Second part of replacement reactions is the double replacements. Okay. In this one, you take usually two ionic compounds and they switch partners. The cation from one goes with the anion from the other and the others. So if you have A, B plus C, D, you're going to end up with A, D, and C, B. Usually the way these work is they form some kind of a precipitate. Remember those reactions we did where we saw the precipitate? That forms a solid, that precipitate is a solid, and that's usually what happens in these kinds of reactions. So you've got, um, for instance, aqueous barium chloride and sodium sulfate. So what's going to happen here, based on knowing that kind of a, knowing that this is a double replacement reaction, which you can assume any time you see two ionic compounds like this. So if you're going to switch their partners, what goes with what? What's one of the compounds going to be? Yeah, barium with sulfate. So how are, how are those ratios going to work? How many bariums and how many sulfates in barium sulfate? Yeah, it's going to be one to one because barium's plus two, sulfate's minus two. So barium sulfate is BASO4. And you wouldn't necessarily know this, but I'll just tell you it's a solid, it's a precipitate. So then what's the other, what's the other uh, product? NaCl. NaCl, right. So the sodium goes with the chloride. This is an example where using the names can actually help you out um, because the names absolutely do just switch without anything tricky. So if we write barium chloride and sodium <coughs> sulfate, the sodium goes with the chloride and the barium goes with the sulfate. So then we've got barium sulfate and sodium chloride. And then you can go back and, and put the formulas together. Um, if you just did it from the 
formulas, you might end up with Na2Cl2, but that's not sodium chloride. Sodium chloride is NaCl. We do have to balance this, so we would put a 2 here. Okay. And then the final category we're going to look at um, is called combustion. Combustion is sometimes used in a bunch of different situations. We're going to define it specifically as um, hydrocarbon based. So something like C4H10 reacts with O2 to form CO2 plus H2O. We've balanced this a couple times today. So a combustion reaction is, you can spot, because it's always some kind of CHO type compound. Reacting with oxygen. That's what makes it specifically combustion. And that's what makes it fit into this category. So you look for something with carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, maybe you, not all those, but those reacting with oxygen and then the nice thing about this one is that it always forms the same products so once you've identified a reaction as a combustion reaction you know it's going to form carbon dioxide and water that's always the products you don't have to do anything tricky about making compounds or whatever. It's just carbon dioxide and water. And that's a combustion reaction. So the equation has carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, no matter what, it's always combustion. I would say that's a little too general. But I would say if oxygen is one of the, if oxygen specifically like O2 is one of the reactants, then it's combustion. That's the kind of combustion is in its most general form defined as reaction with oxygen. Um, it's usually kind of burny, explosive, I don't know, whatever you call that. It sets on fire when you do it. Um, and that's why we talked about talk about things being combustible. Right, that reaction with oxygen. If something's on fire, you want to put it out and smother it, make sure it can't get oxygen. And the things that we worry about burning, like our stuff, houses, whatever, are made of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Organic matter and um, oil and stuff like that. So, yeah. All right, questions about this stuff? Okay. Feel like you can practice this a bit? Okay. I will post uh, another kind of practice worksheet, since we didn't really get to it today, in the notes folder. Take a look at that, start working through that. Wednesday before lab, we'll have a quick quiz on the old stuff. And then next week, Monday, we'll do a quiz on this stuff. So if you do have questions, um, contact me via Slack or email or come to my office hours, um, whatever. Try to get try to get this stuff taken care of. If you're not great at it by Monday, don't worry about it. We'll, we'll be working on this for a while, so we'll keep practicing.